you know that there's someone in this room that does not know Jesus as Savior, would you quicken that person's spirit right now that they might know and be aware of their lostness and hear today of Jesus as their rescue? Lord, thank you for your truth, for your life, that your son Jesus is the way. We pray in his name. And God's people say, amen. All right, so have a seat. Keep your Bibles open. I hope you'll find on your worship guide, your worship folder, uh, that outline that will help you follow along. The, The statement that we are using today to consider is that Jesus did not come to show us a way to the Father. He did not come to give us five steps to be a better person, seven steps to be a better husband. He did not come to show us a way to the Father. He himself is the way to the Father. There is no other sufficient truth to believe in. There is no other successful life to live. Friends, evangelism is very simple. Evangelism is not about methodology, it is about a man. Evangelism is not about ritual and religion, it is about a relationship. Evangelism is not about piety, it is about a person. Jesus Christ has come to be the way to eternal life. There is no other way except him. And so just understand that when you're trying to think about it, you're not telling somebody how they ought to live. You're introducing them into a new relationship with the God who sent his only son to die for them, to save them from their sin. This passage that we're reading here, John chapter 14, is at the very beginning of what we call the upper room discourse. We we call this the upper room discourse because Jesus has, for the final time, left public life. So John chapter 12, the public ministry of Jesus closes. Now he will publicly die on a cross, but his ministry of teaching and miracle working, all those things, that has closed. And now he draws away with the disciples in John chapter 13. And officially beginning in John chapter 13 and verse 31 and continuing on through chapter 14, 15, and 16, and then in chapter 17, what we call the high priestly prayer, Jesus is sharing with the disciples around the Passover meal. They are talking together. He's giving them an idea about what's about to happen. First, he says, I'm leaving you. I'm about to depart. And then he helps them to understand what they can expect. This is going to be difficult. If the world hated you, don't worry because they hated me first, Jesus says. In this world, he says, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He says, I don't know what to expect, but he he says, I'm going to equip you. He says, as a matter of fact, it's really good for you that I go away because there's a helper coming. And then finally, that equipping is for a purpose. Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. You will love one another. And there's one more, and it's coming to me, I believe. I can't remember all of a sudden. I can't believe I can't remember that third one. I'll remember, and you can come to me later, and I'll tell you. (laughs) That's very funny. So Jesus is preparing them for what's coming next, how he will equip them, and how they are to behave. Now, we're told in 14.1 that as this upper room discourse begins, that the disciples are troubled. He says in 14 verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. I find find great comfort in studying that word in the book of John. Because when you just go back a few, uh, just a couple of chapters, John chapter 12 and verse 21, or verse 27, and John chapter 13 and verse 21, Jesus is troubled. Same verb. Same descriptive term. So the same thing that the same emotions that the disciples are experiencing, Jesus is experiencing. How comforting is it that whatever you are going through, whatever your emotional state is, Jesus understands. He's experienced that. He tells the disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Well, why are their hearts troubled? Well, there are a few things going on here in this upper room discourse. 
Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. And then in verse 21, we're told that Jesus' heart is troubled. Because he says, he reveals to the disciples, one of you is about to betray me. Well, this throws the guys into quite a tizzy. They don't know what to think about that. What do you mean one of us is going to betray you? And the disciples in Jesus, they're, they're not, this is not da Vinci's depiction of the Last Supper, okay? They're all, they're all around a table, and the way you did you reclined at the table. And so pretty much because most everybody was right-handed, they would lean towards the table that was low to the ground on their left elbow, eat with their right hand with their feet behind them, all right? You got the picture before I fall off the stage? So John... The author of our gospel is nearest to Jesus. Probably John is here. Jesus is just behind him. And it says that Peter, upon Jesus' testimony about one of them to betray him, says, kind of motions to John. Ask him who he is. Right? He's going to ask him who he is. And so John's closest, and it appears as if John leans back close enough to hear the Savior's heart beating. And he says, Jesus, what do you mean? Who is going to betray you? And Jesus says very quietly to John, the one I'm about to give this piece of bread to. Now, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because when he gives the piece of bread to Judas, and Judas gets up to leave, all the other disciples are sitting there going, what just happened? We don't know what's going on. And so this is a very private, intimate moment between Jesus and John, but a very confusing moment for all the disciples. And so certainly you can understand why their hearts would be troubled. But maybe it's also because in verse 36 we're told Simon Peter uh, is responding to Jesus' statement in verse 33, where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And so now we've got the leader of the 12. One of them has been dismissed. Now the leader of those who are remaining, his pending failure is imminent, right? Right? These, these been promised before the night's over with, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Well, that would be troubling. But there's no doubt that the most troubling thing is what Jesus says to them in verse 33. John chapter 13, verse 33. Little children, my dear children, a term of sweet, precious intimacy. My dear children, my little Children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Wait, 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 Jesus. What are you talking about? I mean, remember, today is what? Palm Sunday, right? And so their week had begun on Palm Sunday with this pep rally for Jesus. I mean, it appeared as if everything was going their way. Why leave now, Jesus? What are you talking about? This is our moment. Well, Jesus knew that it was his moment, but he knew that his moment included the cross. And where he was going, they could not come. Notice, though, the antidote for their trouble. Is your heart troubled today? Hear the words of Jesus. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Friends, I cannot tell you how all things in your life are going to work out, but I can tell you if you will hold on to Jesus, he will be an anchor that is steadfast and immovable. Believe. Again, believe in the one who's under, who understands you. He's been troubled too. Believe in the one who is equal with God. Here again, John, the gospel writer, is raising the flag of the deity of Jesus so that all eyes will be lifted high to him. He is the word that was with God and was God, was in the beginning, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, and we beheld his glory. And so Jesus is 
God. God is Jesus. Jesus and the Father are one. And he says, believe in God, believe also in me. The antidote for the heart trouble that we all experience is sometimes it is always to trust. Now their trouble quickly becomes their advantage, right? The source of their trouble, Jesus departing, then becomes the source of their advantage. Look in verse 2 through 4. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. Some of your translations probably say mansions. That means places. It means there's space for everyone. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So the first advantage is this. Jesus is going to prepare for them an eternal home. And it is personal. It is for you. And there is plenty of space. There's a place for all who believe. And then he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to be with me Take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, here's the good news about heaven, friends. What's the best thing about heaven? Is the best thing about heaven my grandma, your grandma? Is the best thing about heaven uh, your pet cat, Snowball? Is that your best thing about heaven? If you want to know what I believe about pets in heaven, you can come and ask me later. Could those things, could our sentimental relationships, could those things be the best thing about heaven? Jesus doesn't say, I'm going there to prepare a place for you so that when I come again, you can be with your grandma. Or you'll see Snowball one more time. He says that you may be what? Where I am. That you may be with me. Friends, Jesus is the center of heaven. He is the light emanating throughout eternity. If it was just you and Jesus for the rest of eternity, which it won't be, but if it was just you and Jesus, that would be enough. His presence will satisfy all believers for all eternity. Amen. Amen. This is to your advantage that I depart, Jesus says. Not only was that to their advantage, the preparation of an eternal home, but the imminent arrival of the indwelling spirit was also to their advantage. Now, we're not going to get deep into this, but just know that through 14, 15, and 16, we are told that the spirit is on his way. In John chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus says this very plainly. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I do not go, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And through chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will come and he will teach you. He will bear witness about me. He will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness, and he will guide you into all truth. That's in those texts that are there for you in your study guide. It'd be a great little Bible study for you to do on your own. What is the Holy Spirit's job from John chapter 14, 15, and 16? And so Jesus says to them, here is your advantage that I go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you, an eternal place for you. And the Holy Spirit is on his way for you. And so, Thomas, now let's give Thomas a break, okay? Now we know Thomas, what do we often call Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas, right. But Thomas is just inquisitive. He's kind of like a millennial. He's always asking questions, right? Why this? How that? But let's not forget that as Jesus turns his attention to go to Jerusalem, Bethany, where he raises Lazarus from the dead, it is Thomas who says, let us go with him and there die with him. So he's a man of great faith. He's also the one upon Jesus' resurrection. He said, I'll believe it when I Here Jesus says in verse 4, he says, you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas says, time out. How can we know where you're, the way to where you're going if you don't tell us where you're going? It's like trying to figure out the way someplace without how to, how to, how to navigate somewhere without the address in your GPS. Thomas says, I, if you just give us the GPS, we'll figure it out. Thank you very much. Give us the address. Show us the way. And what does Jesus say? Thomas, I am the way and the truth 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so what Jesus is focusing on is opposite, is counterintuitive to what Thomas is focusing on. Thomas focuses on what? The how, right? Isn't that what we do? We want to know how. How do you follow Jesus? We want five easy steps to become a better Christian, right? That's what we want. Just give us a six-week Bible study on how to become a better person, and we'll be just fine. But that's not the gospel, friends. The gospel is that Christ died for your sin. There is no way to become a better person. We just have to trust and believe by grace and through faith that God can make you into a new creation. And so Jesus doesn't say, I am a way to the Father. Let me show you how to do this. He says, I am the way. Jesus doesn't focus on the how. Jesus focuses on the who side of the question. How do we know the way? Jesus is saying, you know it, Thomas. I am the way. This is not about methodology, friends. It is about about a man, Jesus. It is not about religion. It is not about ritual. It is about a relationship. It's not about piety. It is about a person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bearing my sin and your sin on the cross. We are preparing ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. There's no better way, I do I think, that we can do that than to discuss these truths. To be glad that we are saved and to say to God, if that's all you ever do for me, that is enough. To be glad that no matter what we accomplish in our lives, to rejoice that our names are recorded, written in heaven. That is enough. That's what it means to come to the Lord's table in gratitude and humility. To say, whatever you have done for me, whatever you do for me, all I need is Jesus. All I need is him. I want to share with you another beautiful meditation on these words from a 21st, 20, 20th and 21st century commentator, theologian named Don Carson. This little poem, these three sonnets are in your worship folder. I gave them to you so that maybe as you worship through the week in preparation for Easter Sunday that you might read through these and meditate on these words. The gospel is not about methodology It is about the man, Jesus, bearing our sin on the cross, the way, the truth, and the life. Carson writes for us, I am the way to God. I did not come to light a path to blaze a trail that you may simply follow in my tracks. I pursue and pursue my shadow like a prize that's cheaply won. My life reveals the life of God, the sum of all he is and does. So how can you, the sons of night, Look on me and construe my way as just the road to run. My path takes in Gethsemane, the cross, and stark rejection draped in agony. My way to God embraces utmost loss. Your way to God is not my way, but me. Each other path is dismal, swamp, or fraud. I stand alone. I am the way to God. I am the truth of God. I do not claim. I merely speak the truth as though I were a prophet, but no more. A channel stirred by spirit power of purely human frame. Nor do I say that when I take his name upon my lips, my teaching cannot err, though that is true. A mere interpreter, I am not some prophet voice of special fame. In timeless reaches of eternity, the triune God decided that the word, the self-expression of deity, would put on flesh and blood and thus be heard. The claim to speak the truth, good men applaud. I claim much more, I am the truth of God. I am the resurrection life. It's not as though I merely bear life-giving drink. A magic elixir, which men might think, is cheap because though lavish, it's not bought. The price of life was fully paid. I fought with death and black despair, for I'm the drink of life. The resurrection mourns link between death and endless life long sought. I am the firstborn from the dead, and by my triumph, I deal death to lusts and hates. My life I now extend to men and ply them with the draft that ever satiates. 
Religion's page with empty boasts is rife, but I'm the resurrection and the life. Friends, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Any other interpretation of this passage finds us having to ask the question, was I good enough? Am I good enough? If I'm just simply trying to follow six easy steps to becoming a better person, and maybe you've shared the gospel with someone along the way, and they have said to you, well, I hope that I've been good enough. You know the answer to that question every time, right? There is no one who is good enough. Romans chapter 3 tells us there is none who is righteous. There is none who seeks God. There is none who understands. No, not one. Are you good enough? Am I good enough? No. Friends, we do not trust in a way to the Father. We trust in the way to the Father, the resurrection and the life. In the moments that immediately preceded these statements, Jesus gathered around a table with his disciples, and they shared together in a meal. They called it the Passover. It was an ancient celebration of God's provision and protection that Jesus said to the disciples is taking on a brand new meaning. Something totally new is happening here. No longer is the bread a flattened, unleavened piece of Bread, indicating, reminding about the quickness of their departure from Egypt, the children of Israel's departure from Egypt. No longer is the wine representative of blood of a lamb that was spread over the doorposts of the children of Israel to protect them from the wrath of God that was visiting Egypt, all of Egypt that night. He said, no, no longer does this bread represent an ancient Historical event. This now is my body. This now is my blood. And Paul tells us that before we receive this cup, before we receive this bread, we ought to examine ourselves. He says, for some have taken of this communion in a manner unworthy and thus have died. So we ought to want to know today. How not to participate here in a manner unworthy of the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, let me tell you, first of all, it's not to be sinless. That's not what it means to be worthy. Because if that were the case, turn up the lights, open the doors, let's all go home. What does it mean to be receiving this worthily today? It means, would you recognize that you're a sinner? And as hard as you try, your life is broken, even in your best effort. And would you trust in God's provision for your forgiveness? That's what it means. That's what it means to be worthy. So see your sin for what it is. Don't don't overestimate your sin as if God cannot forgive it. Don't underestimate your sin as if it doesn't need to be forgiven. See God for who he is. Demanding holiness, offering forgiveness for all who will come to him. We're going to have a brief time of examination. And as we begin that time, I want to read to you, I often read in in private devotion uh, from a little book called The Valley of Vision. It's a collection of, of Quaker prayers, all right, so written long, long time ago. And I want you to bow your heads, and I want to read this Lord's Supper prayer. God of all good, I bless thee for the means of grace. Teach me to see in them thy loving purposes and the joy and strength of my soul. Thou hast prepared for me a feast, and though I am unworthy to sit down as guest, I wholly rest on the merits of Jesus and hide myself beneath his righteousness. When I hear his tender invitation and see his wondrous grace, I cannot hesitate, but must come to thee in love. By thy spirit, enliven my faith, rightly to discern and spiritually to apprehend the Savior. While I gaze upon the emblems of my Savior's death, the bread and the cup, 
May I ponder why he died and hear him say, I gave my life to purchase yours, presented myself an offering to expiate your sin, shed my blood to blot out your guilt, opened my side to make you clean, endured your curses to set you free, bore your condemnation to satisfy divine justice. Oh, may I rightly grasp the breadth and length of this design. Draw near, obey, extend the hand, take the bread, receive the cup, eat and drink, testify before all men that I do for myself gladly in faith, reverence and love, receive my ward to be my life, strength, nourishment, joy, delight. In the supper, I remember his eternal love, boundless grace, infinite compassion, agony, cross, redemption, and receive assurance of pardon, adoption, life, glory. As the outward elements nourish my body, so may thy indwelling spirit invigorate my soul until that day when I hunger and thirst no more and sit with Jesus at his heavenly feast. Do you know this Savior today? This time of examination is for all of us to see our sin as it is. Do not underestimate it. Do not overestimate it. Trust God to forgive you now. Maybe you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior. Do it right now. And join us in this communion of the community of faith. Join us at this table we all recognize together that we are not worthy it is only Christ who makes us worthy trust him now I want to give you a few moments just to quietly meditate and examine your own heart if it is to be saved today then trust in him if it is to rectify your sin before him then do that right now This altar is open. Let's just worship quietly for a few moments. invite our our deacons they'll be serving us this morning to come forward these men are your deacons they are our servant leaders and they're here to serve you this morning as the community of faith and then you will serve one another as the community of faith you may ask yourself am I eligible to receive the Lord's Supper to communion today the Lord's Supper today If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, a member of the body of Christ, the family of Christ, then yes, please join us. If you're not, then don't. If your children have never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, this is a great teaching moment to talk to them about what it means to trust in Christ. And if they have, then enjoy celebrating not only as a biological family, but as a spiritual family body and the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. Father, we ask as we distribute these elements that you will draw us near and into your presence for the purpose, Father, of your worship. As this bread and this cup become a part of our bodies physically Lord, may we recognize that our salvation is who we are. In you, we live and move and have our being. Our identity is in Christ. 
And so as these physical elements become a part of our physical body, may we recognize that you are body, soul, mind, spirit. You are everything to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus says to us, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Jesus says, this is my body. It is for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. And he said, he said, this cup is a new covenant. It's a new way for God to deal with man and man to know God. This cup is his blood, friends. He says, drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Most gracious Father, if there was ever a moment that we could celebrate your goodness, it is here at the table of your son and his sacrifice. Reminded that we can't do anything but receive it. God, how good you are. How perfect and sufficient you are. Oh, Lord, I pray that this, this morning would be such a, would it just be ignite our worship so that as we are talking with our friends about our excitement about Easter Sunday, that we would not be talking to them about methodology or religion or ritual or piety, but we would talk about a real personal relationship with the one who is the way and the truth and the life. The one who died, laid down his life for us. The one who rises again in authority and in power and in victory that becomes the possession of all who believe. We are resurrection people. God, let us act like it. May we act like it. In the power of your spirit, we thank you for this time of worship today. In the name of our Lord and Savior, the risen one, all God's people say, amen, amen. It was supposed to be a day of mourning, a day of defeat. It was a day for the critics and skeptics to point the finger with smug satisfaction and declare, your savior was a fraud. His death has proven it. He is buried, he is gone, and he will be forgotten. It was supposed to be a day of darkness and a day of grief day when broken and confused followers felt lost and overwhelmed with hopelessness. Even those who went to visit the tomb that day expected to find nothing more than a lifeless body. It was supposed to be a day of sadness and weeping. But you transformed it into a day of rejoicing a day of victory, a day when the children of God can shout with confidence, He is alive, He is risen, and He will never be forgotten. This day has driven out all darkness and grief, erased all sin and shame. 
a day when followers of the true Savior are flooded with purpose, promises, and hope. This day echoes through the halls of history as the day our king crushed the head of the snake, tore through the chains of death itself, and claimed mankind for his kingdom. Tears of despair have become tears of overwhelming joy. For the Lord, Jesus Christ, has made this day of sorrow into a day of worship. Stand up with us. So we just worship on our way out today. We just think about the cross, we think about Calvary. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds. His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Can't you see it? His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed. By heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days. We will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Come on, let's lift this up with some triumph. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the sun of Come on, aren't you glad in that?
celebration next Sunday. Have a good Sunday.